dear friends and colleagues in STEAM education. It is with great enthusiasm and satisfaction that I welcome you to the second edition of the European Summit for STEAM Educators, organized by the EAS, the European Network of STEAM Educators. This event represents a significant milestone in our educational journey, where we come together to explore, learn, and inspire meaningful changes in our educational practices and, most important, in the world in which we live. We live in an era of monumental challenges and one of the most pressing global challenges we face is climate change. Planet Earth is at a critical juncture and future generations will face significant consequences if we do not act now. As educators, we have a responsibility to prepare our students to understand and confront this monumental challenge. STEAM education built on the pillars of science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics is a powerful tool for engaging the next generation in this urgent cause. It offers a holistic approach to learning, enabling students to explore the complexities of climate issues, understand the science behind climate change, develop technological skills for innovation, and use the creativity of the arts to, communi to communicate and inspire action. By embracing STEAM education, we empower our fellow students to become problem solvers and agents of change. They not only grasp the urgency of climate change, but are also equipped with the skills and knowledge needed to create and implement effective solutions. Our role as educators is to catalyze this transformation and inspire a generation deeply concerned about the future of our planet. In addition to the challenge of climate change, we face crucial ethical issues related to technology use. Technology advancement has brought extraordinary benefits, but has also brought complex ethical dilemmas that we cannot ignore. STEAM education is not just about teaching technical skills. It is also about promoting strong ethical values, and it is our responsibility as educators to highlight the importance of using technology for the common good and avoiding its harmful use. We need to emphasize the ethics behind technological innovations and ensure that our students understand the implications of their actions. Furthermore, STEAM education challenges us to avoid the waste of human talent, natural resources, and most importantly, lives in conflicts and wars. We must encourage to use the skills and the knowledge built by STEAM education also to build a more peaceful and sustainable world. STEAM education should not only empower students to create advanced technologies, but also to use them responsibly and ethically. In this summit, we have the privilege of hosting a diverse range of renowned speakers, each one bringing their own expertise and unique perspectives to enrich our debates and discussions. Each speaker generally, uh, generously shares their knowledge and best practices, contributing to the enrichment of us all. Is, as always, had a mission to connect STEAM educators 
and promote collaboration and the sharing of best practices. Our speakers personify this mission and it is through their dedication and generosity that we can continue to progress as an educational community. Our speakers are also true educational leaders, innovators and visionaries in their respective fields. They are constantly challenging established norms, exploring new educational approaches and empowering students to be the protagonists of their own intellectual, cultural and social development. They are inspiring examples of what STEAM education can achieve. As educators and advocates of STEAM education, we recognize that learning never ends. Our roles are constantly evolving as we face new challenges and opportunities in a rapidly changing world. Continuous learning is essential for our own empowerment and for provi providing the best learning experiences to our students. Is and this summit play a crucial role in providing a space for continuous learning. Here we can exchange ideas, explore new, new educational approaches and discover the latest trends in STEAM education. Our speakers are valuable resources in this learning process, sharing their experiences and insights to inspire our practices. While this is an European, an European summit, we must recognize the importance of our colleagues from America and Asia who join us. Their global perspectives enrich our discussions and demonstrate how STEAM education transcends geographical boundaries. We live in an increasingly interconnected world and this summit reflects that reality. As we look to the future, our hope is to further expand our horizons and welcome participants from other continents in the coming editions. The diversity of ideas and experiences is one of our greatest assets and global collaboration is essential for addressing global challenges such as climate change and ethical issues related to technology. In summary, the second edition of the European Summit of STEAM Educators is more than just an educational event. It is a platform for progress, innovation and inspiration. We come together as a global community of STEAM Educators with the responsibility of shaping the future. We face significant challenges such as climate change and complex ethical issues related to technology. However, STEAM education emerges as a powerful tool to address these challenges head on. It empowers our students to become problem solvers and agents of change, promoting ethical values and responsibility in technology use. Our speakers are shining examples of what STEAM education can achieve. They generously share their knowledge and expertise, inspiring us to elevate our educational practices. Continuous learning is therefore essential for our growth as educators and the enhancement of our skills. As we gather at this event, let us remember the transformative power of STEAM education. It empowers our students, but also has the potential to change the world, starting with our close, closest context our classes, our activities, our projects, at school, in the makerspace, in the fab lab, 
in the library, in the museum, or even, or even on the street. We cannot fail to mention that we see STEM education as something that cuts across all age groups. From kindergarten to more experienced seniors, the project-based learning experience, based on the maker mentality and following constructionist ped pedagogical principles, is an educational approach appropriate for any age. Why not have a group of elderly people build a small robot? Or build a LED that lights up in the kindergarten? Isn't it surprisingly fantastic? Let us make the most of this opportunity and work together to create a brighter future for all. I thank each one of you for joining us at this extraordinary event. And what we do here has the potential to impact not only our lives, but also the future of our educational community. Let us make the most of this opportunity and continue our journey in STEAM education with enthusiasm and determination. Thank you for being part of the EAST Summit 2023. Hello, my name is Desna Lampic, and I am a kindergarten teacher from Zagreb, Croatia. I'm also a Globe Educator, a Scientix Ambassador, and also a member of the Croatian Association promoting STEM education and lifelong learning. I will introduce you to the GLOBE program and the learning communities that impacted my professional development. The GLOBE program and or the GLOBE learning and observations to benefit the environment program is an international science and education program for a worldwide community of students, teachers, researchers, and lifelong learners for a better understanding of the planet Earth. More than 125 countries joined the program, and more than 130 million measurements are recorded in the GLOBE database. Elementary GLOBE is adapted for younger students. You can participate in the GLOBE program as an institution or as an individual citizen. More information can be found at the GLOBE portal. The GLOW program involves five main research areas, the atmosphere, biosphere, pedosphere, hydrosphere, and the Earth as a system, as well as a synergy of all four research areas. Various science protocol can be conducted by students. For the lower primary and kindergarten students, the atmosphere and biosphere protocols can easily be adapted by making observations and measurements, we are doing citizen science. Along with simple measurement tools, two apps can be used to record the observations. NASA Globe Observer app has main observation areas, clouds, mosquitoes, trees, and land cover. In addition to the Globe Observer app, Grow app can record a time-lapse video of trees and plants. Often apps are used in various globe measurement campaigns. For the detection of suitable activities and citizen science protocol for younger students, the GLOBE program elementary K4 project was created. The project is a platform with useful STEM resources. It includes a network of kindergartens and primary schools that implement GLOBE activities and offer collaboration to all the vertical of our educational system. The project is designed on three platforms. The website offers all the information about the projects and activities, and it's connected with a weekly profile that contains all the resources and also shares STEM activities by teachers. The Facebook group we use for announcements and networking. The atmosphere 
and clouds observation protocols are easy to use even with younger students. <clears throat> Block observer clouds and cloud identification key are the primary tools for making the observations. The biosphere, green down, and green up science protocol can also be conducted efficiently with younger students. By doing globe citizen science, many STEM follow up activities can be played. The Scientix runs the STEM discovery campaign for the STEM learning community around the world. The opportunities for primary schools and kindergartens were provided by the Look Up Cloud Country Competition, running for second year. For Scientix 2002 and 2003 STEM discovery campaign, the competition was organized to, to promote clouds observation and artistic approach by children observing and photographing interesting clouds. The Clouds Photo Exhibition 2002 is still traveling around the world. The project adapts the hard STEM to the softer STEAM education by involving a transdisciplinary approach. The main goal is to ensure a positive mindset and sustainable education with students, and also to build an environment with competences and skills for the future of education. I would also like to emphasize the importance of learning communities for lifelong learning and mutual collaboration, because by sharing experience and acting together, we can really make a difference. So all the STEM learning communities that impacted my professional development. I have valuable platforms with resources and great crews like enthusiastic change makers. So join this team adventure for sustainable future. You can download the resources and start your journey. So the summit community engage. Hello, my name is Georgina Dimova, and I teach informatics in a primary school, Strasho Pinjur. I'm going to talk about treasure hunt games that can be used in STEAM education to support students learning in a fun and engaging way. A treasure hunt game is activity in which items are hidden in a particular area for children to search out and find. Usually they're given a set of clues to help them do this. I'm going to present to you treasure hunt uh, created outside the school using Google Maps, Google Sheets and QR codes, treasure hunt inside the school using QR codes, physical escape room and digital escape room. This is a treasure hunt game created at the beginning of the school year, mostly for socialization of the students, because we had students from another school to play with our students in mixed group. But the clues are from informatics, chemistry, literature, and foreign language. Clues are hidden on four points in the town, the monument, the recreation center, the town library, and the school. Google map was created with the four points. The students read the explanation on the Google map, uh, they go to the spot and there, after they find the QR code, they scan it and then they solve the puzzle. Students fill the answers of the clues into a Google form. After they find all the clues and fill the correct answers, the Google form opens the final location of the treasure. After all groups get to the final location, um, the group that was first use, uses a drone that is programmed to fly to the location of the, of the treasure. What are the lessons we learned here? The story is very important. It connects all the elements of the treasure hunt. The puzzles should be very carefully designed, especially their difficulty. In our case, uh, we created the puzzles very, very easy to be solved. So, uh, all the activity was just who can run faster than the other. You, sh uh, you should make the puzzles 
difficult enough so the students should use some mental activity to solve them. Uh, it needs a lot of time to prepare, but it is very interesting for the students. Treasure hunt inside the classroom. QR codes with the questions are inside the classroom. They are numbered in this activity. The answer to the question tells you where to go next. Uh, all groups start with a different clue and different puzzle. The puzzles are codes in C++ and the value of the variables tells the group on which position they should find the next puzzle. They all the end up at the same position number 10. When they scan the last code, they have to fill a form where they write the path they all passed to get to the last position. What are the lessons we learned? If this is needs less, less time to be organized, so it can be used many times during the school year. It can be used in any subject for revision, introducing new content, and students can work individually in a pair or in a group. Escape room in the classroom. Setting up a, a classroom escape room is a surefire way to increase student engagement. You can use this challenge to introduce a new topic or to review information students have already learned. Uh, the story behind the escape room is very important here. In my case, the students have to find the device hidden by aliens that is affecting students' brains and turning them into robots. Uh, creating the puzzles and the clue is the, the fun way here. Uh, the first puzzle is to decode a word written in a binary code. Uh, the second puzzle is hidden behind a QR code and students should answer a set of questions and with the first letter of every answer, they create a passcode for the next puzzle. In the third puzzle, students should find the words hidden in an Excel sheet. The fourth puzzle is the simplest one because they should find which device doesn't belong here. It is the monitor, which is an output device and the others an input device. But the interesting here is that it is hidden in the, into the virtual reality world. The last puzzle, puzzle are two photos with only one difference, one book where the device is, is hidden. What are the lessons I learned? It needs a lot of time to be prepared and built. Very positive feedback from the students. They enjoyed the activity. If the puzzles and questions are set properly, students can learn or teachers can see how well they mastered the content. Students are involved not only mentally, but also physically. And the last activity is a digital escape room because we don't always have the resources to build the escape room. We can have the same effects with digitally created escape rooms. I use genially to create such games. As you can see, you can choose from different types of questions and puzzles, different awards. You can create different stories like escape, escape from a deserted island, save the earth from pollution, or open a safe or just decorate a Christmas tree. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Mariana Lazar and I'm a primary school teacher at secondary school number six, Jakob Mureșanu, Brasov, Romania. With 25 years of teaching experience, I was speaker at the first European summit for STEAM educators last year. I've been involved in several meet and code events in the last four years. I'm a scientist ambassador, creator of education winner in 2020, finalist in 2021, digital ambassador since 2019, and e-twinning project lover. Today, I'd like to present a meet and code event and give you some ideas to combine science with art 
and show you how to interdisciplinary STEAM projects help to innovate and teach in a fun way to keep students interested and support them to understand science concepts. I, I uh, hope uh, that our uh, example will be a good inspiration for many teachers who follow us at this important second European Summit for STEAM Educators. The Meet and Code event entitled Water Cycle with Bitten Evo took place in October 2022 and aimed to familiarize students through interdisciplinary STEAM activities based on technology and programming with the properties and states of aggregation of water, as well as explaining the water cycle step by step to integrate a group of students from vulnerable environments in our county. So this event promotes SDG 6 and 10, such as clean water and sanitation and reducing inequality, supports story-based learning and uh, promotes arts, music, poetry, teamwork to introduce concepts from uh, science related to water transformation and uh, its importance for the environment and life. And find measures measures to prevent water pollution and facilitates contact with the world of robotics and learning programming in a fine environment. The students were grouped into teams according to the multiple intelligences such as programmers, scientists, writers, architects, artists, psychologists, and, and ecologists. And now let's see and describe each team programmers who wrote and colored the codes for Ozobots, scientists who explained and made the diagram of the water cycle, writers who composed and read stories or poems of the drop, architect who made 3D models of the water cycle, artists who composed and sang the water cycle song, psychologists, who took uh, the pulse of their colleagues or described the um, emotion of the drop and the ecologists who found ways to prevent water pollution. <laughs> This was the song of the water cycle. Each uh, stanza explained a transformation of the water and so the water cycle step by step in a dialogue between the students. The surprises of the end of the event were some snacks and juices, as well as diplomas and bookmarks with the water cycle with a short explanation to remember what they have learned. To summarize our STEAM activities, we've done from each field, science, uh, by explaining uh, the water cycle and describing water transformation, technology by writing the color codes and programming the Ozobots, engineering by building 3D models or uh, water cycle, arts by composing poems, stories, and songs about the water cycle, and mathematics by using math as elements, measurements, and numbering in their projects. In conclusion, I'd like to point out the three big advantages of this uh, meet and code event, innovation, by uh, developing the 21st century skills such as communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving by uh, innovating to save water or creatively solve real world problems that help them to be competitive in their job of the future. 
vision by introducing to the world of robotics and programming with BIT and EVO Ozobots involving students from, from seven to 14 years old in activities in teams by mixing up the youngest with the older students from other schools from the countryside to realize eco projects with SDG 6 and 10 and by adapting and explaining scientific knowledge according to the age and integrating it into the school curriculum through art and inspiration by making uh, fun, creative and interdisciplinary STEAM activities that engage students in a learning process based on the theory of multiple intelligences to familiarize them with the transformation and importance of water and by creating stories, poems or songs to explain the water cycle. As a scientific ambassador, I strongly recommend the resources from this site where you can find many lesson plans to, for uh, inspiration. Thank you for listening and good luck. Hi, my name is Claudia Maya, and I'm Fed Simulations Professional Development Coach in Latin America. Um, I want to share with you this workshop that is um, a Fed Simulations and Ally for uh, STEM education. So let's start with sharing with you my presentation. Okay. Um, well, the intention is to um, share with you the Fed site and the foundation so that simulations can truly be an ally for STEM education. I am convinced that this workshop will be very useful for those who are dedicated to the area of mathematics or science. Well, let's start saying this. Why science needs practical work? Well, the fundamental aim of teaching science is to help students developing an understanding of the natural world practical work, teaching activities where pupils interact with objects and thereby observe and develop the understanding of the natural world. Scor said, science without practical work is like swimming without water. Well, let's see um, this simulation. And well, FED has an intuitive interface that allows students to self-thought learning guided by a teacher. In this way, the teacher can provide better scaffolding to consolidate knowledge and how this could happen. Well, through powerful pedagogical action that gives the students a better way of learning. And this is achieved through multiple accurate and dynamic representation. Let's see which are the benefits of use and fat. Well, First of all, they have an interactive visualization that allows you to learn scientific concept in the way dynamic, thus helping the, to ensure that helping learning is given gradually and also individually. Since with this, you have reinforcement with different representations that they allow self-directed learning, thus allowing students to learn without feeling directed like you are giving to them cooking recipe. Now let's, uh, let's talk about the creation of it. I want to share with you that um, why FED is helping to reach uh, this um, education, STEM education. Well, it's because they have like a bond with SDG. Uh, Especially in this for SDG, FED fulfills its role with these characteristics. First of all, is free, promotes the inclusion of educator and a student with special needs, promotes among themselves courses and workshops that teach it without discrimination to boys and girls, 
And the use of simulations promotes the development of skills necessary to generate growth in the economy and development of society. Okay, so let's start uh, to talk about FED interactive simulation. FED is Physic Education Technology and was founded by Carl Wiman. And well, uh, he is the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics. And with the prize, he created FED simulations because as a teacher, he saw the need for students to experiment with concrete situation. Now, let's enter the site. Let's see. This is the site, okay? So you have to search in the browser, fed.colorado.edu. And let's go to them. Okay, this is the site. And as you can see, we have um, five uh, courses, five a signature, like it's physics, chemistry, math, earth, uh, earth science, and biology. So if you could um, navigate here and look uh, some interactive simulations here, but uh, the, um, the important here is like uh, you as a teacher, you have to register what is very simple. You just have to um, uh, click this button where say a register and fill in out some questions that are requested. But now let's talk about uh, how to navigate the site and get the most of out of it. And uh, when you, when you, let me, let me sign in. Okay, okay. Um, if I if I go, uh, you can you can go to one of the simulations and then, um, uh, for example, I could go to physics, and um, here are a lot of simulations. We have like a one hundred fifty six simulations that you can use in your classroom. For example, I could use. Let me see this. I like projectile motion. And if you if you could see, uh, we have different uh, bottoms, which allow you, for example, to download the simulation. Here you you could download, and then um, you have a HTML to to have the file, and you could share this file with your students. You. Uh, also can share in different applications. And there are also these tabs that give you some benefits as a teacher, for example, teaching resources, activities, translations. And you could see here, for example, the topics that are um, vinculated with different um, topics. For example, uh, here we have vectors, we have projected motion, parabolic curve, and a uh, sample and learning goals. For example, these have estimated where an object will land given the initial condi conditions. So um, this is very useful for, for our uh, teachers in, in, in our institution. And you could see that here is like a, a sharing with you what is every button in the, in the simulations. So you could see here, for example, uh, uh, the intro is, uh, um, this simulation has three, let me see. Uh, let me share with you this. Okay, it has a, a intro, vectors, drag, and lab. So we could uh, go to this intro and you could, for example, move the conditions uh, initials here and you could use the simulations about uh, what is the velocity and uh, what is the acceleration, uh, what happens if you uh, turn on the air resistance or you change the, um, the object that you are um, trying to, to motion here. For example, if I, if I put a piano and I, okay, and I, I just, um, give this this these initial conditions. Uh, I can change to a human, for example, too. See, 
and and it's very useful because all uh, all these simulations are designed by uh, educators and and a professional um, educators that is physics and mathematics or chemistry and it's very important that this is um, an investigation for all the things that could happen in one simulation and, and be the more uh, realistic. Uh, so we have another, for example, this, this um, just, uh, you could see the vectors here, uh, changing the angle. And you could uh, use to this, that is a lab. You can use this, uh, for example, with, uh, with uh, activities, um, and is 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 different. For example, uh, um, you could you can give different uses to this resource. Uh, you can present the simulations in front of an entire class, for example, asking probing question and promoting critical and reflective thinking. Uh, or you can also design an activity sheet with which you can also find some shared by other teachers in this lab. Like I said, we have. Uh, let me uh, go again to the, let me, okay, here. Um, here is a different um, activity sheet, sheet uh, sorry, that uh, other uh, teachers share with us. So you could find here some, some, some activities to share with your, with your classroom. Um, uh, you can download and use it. You can also uh, use FED simulation as a tool to consolidate knowledge and content through, for example, conceptual questions. Um, but how does FED suggest you use simulations? Uh, simulations uh, are different than if you just uh, share a content and, and, and you can explain an abstract concept. So when you use simulations, for example, uh, you could go here with a uh, uh, say virtual workshop and you can um, uh, go to this uh, workshops, introduction to FED, whole uh, class strategy. And this is very important because um, they share with you some videos and some tips to start to um, share FET simulations in different contexts and uh, give you uh, to uh, some uh, planning uh, template. For example, this, okay. uh, I, I need uh, access, but right now, for example, this, let me, okay. We have here the different uh, topics and different tips for um, um, goals, for, for learning goals uh, into the demonstrations with physics, with, with, with chemistry. So this is a very good way to, to start to use um, uh, FET simulations. If you go where the workshops are, you could start to, uh, uh, learn, start to learn uh, how to use uh, FET simulations. So this is one of the of the tabs you could go. Then uh, you could share your activities. If you design some uh, activities sheet, you could um, you could go to share, and uh, here you uh, upload the files, and or you could share the the link. And this is what we do, sharing with all uh, different uh, teachers that we want to, to help. And because of this is that we are trying to share um, FED simulations with you and trying to, to, to uh, share especially the different uh, simulations that are in physics, chemistry, math, or science and biology. I, I want to invite you that you could go to this FET uh, site and trying to, to enjoy this, the simulations. First, you, you have to, to, to prove it 
Okay, you have to try it and, and you have to, to start to learn how um, the different uh, simulation uh, works. And then you could, um, you could share with your student. So this is what I have for you. And I, I invite you to register and start using FET in your classroom. Thank you for the invitation. And mm -hmm. I remain attentive to any questions, comments on my social networks. You can find me with Claudia Maya Theomatics and it will be my pleasure to share with you more of FET simulation. Thank you. As educators presents the aggregate repository room is a repository of some articles about STEM education. You can try, you can contribute with um, fill a form to refer an article you have read, and so everyone can have easy access to valid knowledge and easily organized. You can read, share, improve STEM education. In this rapidly evolving world, technology has woven itself into the very fabric of our society and its impact on education cannot be ignored. Over the next six minutes, I will delve into how digital technologies are transforming our educational landscape and why they are indeed a bridge to a better future. We find ourselves in an era of an exceptional technological advancement where smartphones, laptops, and the internet are an integral part of our daily lives. Just as these technologies have revolutionized the industries, they have also began reshaping education. Gone are the days when classrooms were limited to chartboards and textbooks. Today, our schools have become digital hubs, offering a plethora of tools that enhance learning in ways we couldn't have imagined before. Digital technologies provide students with a personalized and interactive learning experience. With the aid of educational apps, online tools and tutorials, and multimedia resources, complex concepts can be broken down into easier formats. Visual and interactive not only make subjects more engaging, but also cater to various learning styles, ensuring no students is left behind. Furthermore, the ability to revise and revisit materials at one's own pace promotes deeper understanding. The internet has turned our world into a global village and digital technologies in education have enriched this connectivity. Collaborative projects with students from different corners of the globe are now easily achievable. This fosters cultural understanding, empathy, and the development of crucial skills for a future where cross-curricular collaboration will be the norm. Through online platforms, we can transcend physical boundaries and engage in meaningful discussions that enrich our perspectives. We are on the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution, characterized by automation, artificial intelligence, and digitalization. The jobs of tomorrow will demand a different skill set, critical thinking, problem solving, adaptability, and technological literacy. Integrating digital technologies in education equips us with these essential skills. Learning to navigate various software and tools prepares us for the demands of a tech-driven workforce. However, this transformation is not without challenges. The digital divide wherein not all students have equal access to technology remains a concern. To bridge this gap, schools and policymakers must provide adequate resources to unserved communities. Additionally, the potential of distractions and misuse 
of technology in the classroom must be managed through proper guidelines and monitoring. A common concern is the potential negative impact of increased screen time. While digital technologies are useless, it's crucial to strike a balance between screen-based learning and offline activities. Encouraging physical activities, social interactions, and hands-on experiences remains vital for holistic development. Another important consideration is the protection of students' data privacy and online security. Schools and technology providers must ensure robust measures are in place to safeguard the sensitive information and provide a safe online environment for students to explore and learn. Digital technologies also offer an array of hope for inclusive education. Students with disabilities can benefit greatly from assistive technologies that cater to their individual needs. From text-to-speech applications to adaptive learning uh, platforms, these technologies empower students who may have otherwise faced the barriers in traditional learning environments. In conclusion, the use of digital technologies in school is a bridge to the future. Embracing these tools thoughtfully, we enhance learning experiences, cultivate skills, for the evolving job market and foster global connectivity. As we move forward, it is imperative that we address the challenges and ethical considerations that come with this uh, digital revolution. Let us envision an educational landscape where technology is not just a tool, but a means to empower learners and bridge the gaps that hold us back. The future is digital and it's up to us to harness its potential for a brighter tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Danilo Kozoderz and uh, I am working in Blue Workshop, which is, which is STEM Center of uh, Institute Symmetris uh, in Fram, near Maribor in uh, Slovenia. Uh, so I would like uh, to present to you uh, our praxis, how can we provide learning by uh, prototyping. Uh, at the beginning, a uh, few, uh, few facts about uh, Blue Workshop. So Blue Workshop is local STEM center. So the children after school uh, are coming into our center and learning uh, robotics and coding and, uh, uh, and science. Uh, so we provide uh, some Saturdays activities, uh, holidays activities, and uh, during the week, uh, afternoon activities uh, for children. Uh, engineering and technology is also part of our activities, so they are composing some elements, some, uh, some robots uh, working, uh, woodworking, uh, preparing some uh, models for 3D printing and uh, print uh, them uh, doing with the laser uh, engraving and cutting machine. And we also, we also prepare some education, some seminar for teachers, for kindergarten teachers, uh, also in this area, because we find out that, uh, that sometimes they need some uh some experience they need uh, some encouragement because this could be area they are not very familiar uh, in math is also quite important part of our our work especially math for uh, young children 
maybe from five to eight years because in this age is very important that uh, uh, children could use different materials that they they could uh, they could hold things in their hands and uh, when they are learning uh, they uh, they could combine their hands and uh, their head what is uh, maybe uh, basic things uh, what Maria Montessori uh, said about uh, about learning about the way how children learn best So I uh, I would start with some example or examples of uh, failed teaching. Maybe one of uh, the most important of these examples is that students only reproduce the factual no knowledge. Why? Because the facts and definition are the only things that matter. Maybe it's not maybe it's not exactly so but children children understand that this is only that matter they have to reproduce sometimes uh, in the right uh, exact words the they uh, they heard uh, the teachers and because of this way there is no time to create so learners create nothing could be could be whole day or whole week uh, in the school that uh, learners that uh, students didn't create anything didn't use their hands some uh, some materials some uh, some tools some machines and the result of this is that monotony and boredom take over if you have to be uh, focused only uh, on listening and uh, writing is this quite uh, quite obvious results uh, those uh, those of you who study some pedagogical uh, studies they you are probably uh, meet the bloom taxonomy uh, and uh, I could say that this Bloom taxonomy, as we understand, as we could understand, uh, is uh, maybe the reason for some this failed uh, failed teaching. Why? Uh, this Bloom taxonomy uh, is like a pyramid, and here as basement is remembering. So this is the first phase of uh, of learning through this uh, through this picture uh, we could uh, we could think that this is the beginning and we have to we have to start here and what is uh, what is uh, even worse uh, after this part of remembering we don't have enough time or we don't have any time more so the learning process is finishing here we don't try to understand or to apply or to analyze or to evaluate or even to create something so we stop here and this is quite often in the school so i suggest turn around turn around this uh, bloom pyramid so start with creating create something uh, do with uh, materials with toys uh, experiment and then evaluate and analyze uh, and uh, start finding some uh, applying and uh, understand and even remember this because when you are working with things when you are when you have to make something yes you have to understand some facts you you need to know some definitions and these definitions uh, are are part of this structure you are create and you really could understand what this definition mean and you you could 
you could remember this because they are not falling down. They, uh, they, uh, they are part of this, your creation. Okay. Uh, I will start uh, this uh, uh, this process uh, of explaining what uh, what I mean with learning by prototyping with one concrete case. So uh, we uh, bring these different Lego bricks uh, to group of children and uh, tell them very very simple uh, very simple uh, task make a car with these bricks so using some tires uh, using some uh, different elements and and using this uh, pull up motors which is motor uh, uh, which could accumulate uh, elastic energy and then transform into the kinetic energy. And uh, I also I also show this. So when you when you turn this in this way and release, the tires start uh, start rotating. So prepare the car which will uh, make the longest distance, which uh, which is strength enough and which is also beautiful, nice, uh, nice looking. And uh, you have 20 minutes for first prototype. So start working very fast. Uh, start with uh, this, what you know now. And after 20 minutes, we will test this we will see how uh, how long your car could uh, drive, and after this we uh, we make a test. Uh, we evaluate a little bit. Uh, maybe uh, maybe some uh, maybe some car uh, maybe some make a car, and when they release, uh, the tires are not rotating. So what is wrong? Okay. Could be a friction uh, between the tires and the other part of uh, of this car. So we could uh, talk a little bit about friction. What is friction and how to uh, how to do uh, how to make this friction uh, smaller. And we also uh, we also think about how to make uh, construction strength enough. So after the the children have experience, after they uh, they see the result of their first prototype, after this we provide some facts and definition that they could improve their car. And these facts and definition are now part of this day construction so uh, they could understand this much uh, better uh, the second possibility a little bit more complicated with a little bit more sophisticated lego bricks lego we do they uh, they start to make a car which will be the fastest so also prototype improving. Uh, here are two uh, ways of improving programming ways and uh, uh, mechanical ways. So it's a even a little uh, bit more complicated. And in uh, both cases here and the case before, uh, the children are working in groups. So is this uh, peer learning and also a little bit of competition, which group uh, will make a car uh, which will be the fastest or which will uh, drive the uh, the longest uh, distance. So uh, the main the main rule here is quick to fall, early to learn. So don't uh, don't uh, think too much in your head. So start working. 
start doing uh, start doing do something okay and uh, and test test every every new things you uh, you prepare test and you will see how it's working because uh, your head is sometimes a little bit how to say uh, boxed and it's difficult uh, for head to find out but when we are using uh, our hands and head which is prototyping the results are better so one one more case uh, when we are uh, thinking or talking about renewable energy and uh, maybe about energy of wind uh, we could uh, we could provide uh, children a task to uh, prepare wind uh, wind power mill also with this lego bricks uh, and uh, we add some uh, paper and scissors and some uh, glue tape and children prepare such things and we uh, we test this uh, in front of a big uh, big fan and we can see how how fast this rotating and uh, we can uh, we can redesign uh, this part uh, so uh, also yes prototype test improve test And uh, it's, uh, yes, this learning by prototyping is funny. Uh, peer learning. Uh, and uh, also opening, open, the children are open for definition, for definition and facts because definition and facts help them to make things better. And this is their goal. Uh, especially if there are some kind of competition. Okay, uh, one one more case I would like to uh, show you how uh, how this prototyping is uh, enabling or not in uh, not only enabling but also forcing uh, this peer learning and also could uh, could bring us into the flow. Uh, so here is also very simple, very simple task, very simple description. With this, uh, these elements prepare a construction for a for a roof, and they are working in group. And because the rules are very simple, uh, there is no definition, no uh, no facts. Uh, they uh, the children are not are not focused on their mind but they are start working they are start learning and uh, they are falling in this process of flow uh, where uh, it's not necessary where uh, they are they are not uh, they everybody is working and everybody knows what have to do without a lot of uh, words And the testing uh, is here. So is strength enough and is big enough? Okay, successful learning process is finished or not finished, but uh, result is very good.
Okay, and now for the end, uh, some guideline, guidelines for teachers. How to, uh, how to do good this learning by prototyping. Be lazy, be inefficient, uh, let the children have dirty hands, passion and usefulness, passion of teachers. Start with creating, and yes, this is all part of prototyping. Uh, let's look uh, for some of these uh, bullets uh, a little bit more uh, deep. Be lazy. Oh, I have, as teacher, I have to be lazy. No, this is not good. But what means this pedagogical laziness? This means that you are on site. When uh, students are preparing a prototype, you are not there and said, oh, this is not working. Yes, this is, this is good. So be lazy, relax, don't do anything, observe. Be inefficient. This is also hard for teachers because we know we have maybe, I don't know, uh, here in Slovenia, 45 uh, minutes. And in this 45 minutes, we have to, uh, we have to uh, tell this and this and this and solve these uh, problems and maybe uh, make some, uh, some uh, draw something. Uh, we have to be very, uh, very efficient. But in this process of learning by prototyping, this process is could be quite inefficient. Uh, so uh, if, uh, as I said, uh, in uh, through this this process, we learn or our children learn about friction, about uh, elastic energy, about transformation of energy from elastic to uh, to kinetic energy. But we uh, we need maybe 45 minutes or 60 minutes for this. If we as teachers only uh, tell the students definition, uh, we could do this in 10 or 15 minutes. We could be efficient, but what would be result, result on the long way? Uh, would children understand this? Would ch children remember this? I think no or no not in such amount as through this uh, through this process what means passion passion of teacher uh, we have to we have to teach so much things so many things to the students so if you have some passion Follow your passion time to time, because if you will follow your passion, uh, the children will will follow you because they recognize the passion and they uh, they uh, they like the person who has the passion. Start with creating. Yes, this bloom bloom pyramid uh, turn around and start with creating. Uh, and through this process, as we can see also in this uh, this picture, uh, there are some passion, even maybe flow, and they are they are some uh, joy. So this uh, this process, uh, we we have a lot of a lot of experience working in schools uh, through. Uh, uh, with this uh, process of prototyping and children really enjoy uh, in this uh, and uh, really we see uh, that they learn learn uh, a lot and this uh, these facts stay in their heads okay uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, nice greetings from here, Blue Workshop from uh, Slovenia. Have a nice day and bye-bye.
how to promote steam outside school this is uh, my example i am maria pia borghesan i teach math and science in dante alighieri lower secondary school in merlara merlara is a small village in the north of italy my students are between 11 to 14 years old I have been teaching for more than 30 years. I am a scientist and a twinning ambassador. I have been involved in several uh, European projects. And I, I love teaching, reading and traveling. Uh, STEAM education is a crucial topic for the next generation. But we know and also the European Commission suggests to improve STEAM education from a very early age because children uh, are curious and have a natural disposition to science but uh, unfortunately later sometimes they lose the, this interest and they became bored during a science lesson at school and so starting from this i decided to promote science in a different way outside the school I asked the municipality of my village the possibility to use the local public library and I decided to organize science events for children on Saturday morning because on Saturday morning schools are closed in my country. I started choosing books which contain stories related to science, such as stories about uh, trees, uh, water, or uh, animals, and so on. And the first part of my activity was reading one or two of these books to the children. During the reading, I asked questions to the children, and children asked questions to me. We tried to find an answer together, and I, at the end of the reading, we discuss about the topic with the children. After that, we made the observations. Uh, we observe very simple materials, for example, moss, moss uh, flowers, leaves, uh, and other simple materials you can find uh, inside our home or our school or in the nearby. Uh, the school and we use simple uh, instruments like magnifying glasses or a, a simple um, microscope to observe uh, for example the, the very little animals that are in a drop of water after the observation we perform also very simple experiments about water about the chemistry of the red cabbages and so on and i let the children to perform this experiment it was not important if they were not so able to do this but they were able to try and they were really interested to observe what happens with their uh, and so on activity after that, we have also games, we have also hands-on activities and more because I want children to have a very nice moment. So uh, I want that when they thought about the events, they thought about a pleasant moment so they can connect uh, science with a pleasant moment and they can uh, learn in uh, friendly, in the net, happily and a pleasant uh, situation at the end i decide so so you know i decide to combine science with other activities because i think that the steam approach the multidisciplinary approach is the best way to teach something to the children and sometimes also i try to involve the parents in my activity and i suggest them to take home a science book for their children in order to continue to motivate children to science. And the children were really very curious and very involved. Uh, they were happy, they feel free because they were not at school, they were not scared by the, the teacher. So they feel free to ask, to fail, to have fun together and to discover something new together. And that's why I think this is a very, very nice, very important uh, way to, um, to improve the interest of the students toward science. 
Uh, as you know, the events have a great success and they have to organize more events. I started with two events in February and they have to promote other two events in April and in May. And they had to promise to, to organize more events uh, in the next month. So thank you very much for your attention. If you want to know something more for my experience, feel free to um, send me a mail. This is my email. Um, thank you very much again. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Bye. I'm Claudia uh, I'm speaking from Portugal. I'm going to talk uh, about a uh, playful and holistic approach to teaching, to teaching uh, and learning. I will tell about my experience, speaking about the problem, the objective, the methodology and the results. Uh, the problem in the teaching and learning process, it's usually because the traditional teaching and learning process has limitations such as the passive transmission of knowledge disconnected from the real life and lack of uh, development of social emotional skills. So uh, the aim of the playful and holistic approach to teaching and learning is to promote a more engaging, stimulating and meaningful learning environment for students. Uh, playful elements such as games, dance, music, handwork, cooking, and creative practices enhance the teaching process, promoting emotional and social well being, developing personal and professional uh, skills. Uh, the methodology uh, is here how I apply it to practices. I will mention four concrete examples. Uh, in games, a proxy I used was orienting rays using maps and compass. In this activity, students develop strategy, decision making, leadership, teamwork, and communication. Uh, manual activities uh, are also interesting. An example that I worked with the students was the production of mandalas. Mandalas can be a meditative practice that uh, fosters self-awareness and enhances one's soft skills such as emotional intelligence and uh, self-reflection. Uh, uh, the other example was um, the creation of Samba School, a carnival. Uh, in this activity, students play uh, the infrastructure, musica, musica, musical instruments, dance, and choreography, for example. And the last one is um, uh, developing interpersonal skills taught cooking. Uh, in this activity, students simulate the strategic plan of a restaurant from the bureaucratic part to food preparation. Uh, the initial part uh, is done in the large group where they decide uh, on the type of the restaurant, mission, vision, values, organizational, organizational skills, and individual skills. Then they are divided into groups, and each group is responsible for a dish. Dishes are prepared with certain rules, such as there must be no food for all students, but no, left, uh, no leftovers. In addition, uh, students taste food, which is also a very interesting um, moment. Uh, and finally, the results. Uh, I already mentioned the results when uh, explaining the activities, but the evaluation process is important to validate the results. Uh, the results that we were able to evaluate are only an event. Uh, we have no indicators for future evaluation, but we use two evaluation practices, self-assessment and event evaluation. In the self-assessment, we were observed how each student perceived himself in those individual skills that he defined as necessary for the restaurant, for example. 
And in the evaluation of the event, we can observe the organizational competences also defined by the students. And it means if they manage it to achieve the desired result. This photo was from a class where we use the worksheet to access organizational and individual skills. An example of a situation where a student who was in a group reported during the assessment that he was very irritated with a colleague who was talking and laughing while preparing the dish during the activity in the kitchen. Then he himself spoke how he managed to get around this situation and also exemplified how it would be in a restaurant, in a company, if it were real. Therefore, uh, this moment of evaluation is very important. Um, any questions can be can contact by email and thanks. One of our objectives was to uh, secure funding for uh, two projects uh, implemented by the EAS network. So we're currently uh, working on this Erasmus Plus uh, uh, funding bid in the uh, sector of formal education. The initiative would enable um, school pupils to interface with industry mentors. It would also enable uh, uh, teachers to undergo uh, training on STEAM practices. Uh, there will be uh, an international bootcamp for the students and we will be producing uh, educational resources on meaningful STEAM education. My name is Rui Grillo, I'm the Western Europe Director uh, for Microsoft in it, for the education sector and uh, I'm loving the event so far, it's a great enthusiasm, a lot of people, uh, the keynotes in the morning, the room was, was full and energetic which is always important to start the first day of the event and it's great for us to be here. I'm, I'm really pleased of um, being here at EduTech uh, Europe. I'm looking forward for this uh, event. I mean, it looks good. I'm looking forward for the different panels uh, taking place. And so far, um, I'm, I'm enjoying my uh, stay here. Um, I can. I mean, so far from what I've seen, it looks like an incredibly vibrant event. Um, it was wonderful to speak to the audience who seemed very engaged with the session and I look forward to learning more about it. I think the combination of online and on-site presence through the booth, the sessions, the startup arena has been a rich and energizing experience for the entire team. So far we had a over 40 meaningful conversations with edtechs, universities, schools, non-profits who have a great experience and inspiring ideas to share. Uh, it's great to see how passionate they are about including technology both in the learning experience that they're creating and in their internal operation that they manage on a daily basis. Hi, my name is Annalita Bisogni and I am a STEM teacher at Primary School of Convito Nazionale Gaetano Filangeri, Vibo Valenza, Italy. What I will be presenting is a learning scenario that was developed and implemented for a third grade primary class during the technology hour. This scenario spanned the entire school year and was centered around the reading of the book Hello Ruby by Linda Lucas. I like to work with a central team 
that brings together various concepts from different disciplines. I believe it's important to help young students establish connection between different subjects of study and to build skills based on their uh, existing knowledge and abilities. However, let's take a step back to understand the motivation and the rationale. During the previous school year, I had already identified areas of potential improvement. So, at the, at the beginning of the year, I designed my activities based on the skills I aimed to develop. It's crucial to distinguish between the competences to be developed and those already processes, which need to be acknowledged. The ability plan the creation of cognitive artifacts using prior knowledge, follow a project plan and assess the required materials. Describe the processes using maps or diagrams. Visually represent the work, maps, diagrams, graphs to process the information. Utilize technological tools and computer devices to work with simple programs. Among the transversal skills, foster learning through practical experience, important materials, tools, and the ability to overcome challenges stimulate critical thinking, problem posing, solution seeking, and the reorganization of acquired knowledge. Cultivate an awareness that objects can be designed and realized through collaborative learning process, valuable for solving everyday and unique problems. Develop resilience, motivation for learning, and enhance self-esteem, self-esteem. But above all, the competence I aimed of for my students to rediscover and cultivate was the ability to imagine and critically reinterpret. I wanted each of them to rekindle the creative spark that tends to diminish between the age of eight and nine. This is where Bayol comes into play, not replacing the well-known Bayol the bring your own device, but completing it, bring your own life. To keep this, I selected the methodology for the classroom, opting for the engineering process, think, make, play, improve, and share. The entire school year revolved around continuous action research, encompassing reading, planning, designing, creating, and concluding with a reflective assessments of achievements and, uh, and areas of improvement from, from a metacognitive perspective. At the end of each story chapter, students engaged in trace rounds to consolidate the covered COVID topics. In each lesson, we discussed the characters, enjoyed the described signs, and become engrossed in the narrative. We then proceeded with various phases, starting with creating an unplugged coding style map. Not every lesson included reading a chapter to allow for comprehensive exploration of didactic stimuli and encourage young reader reflection. Unplugging coding in a Ruby's map and the secret language of penguins in October. Surfers and trust around to find the first gen, October, November. Ozobot. <coughs> Ozobot. Learning to program for fixing the garden, November. Assembler ready. Design and construction of immersive virtual and augmented reality environments, November. Unplugged algorithms. Instruction for completing a drawing, December. Reality task. Planning and creating a Christmas card. Assembler ready. Design and construction of it. Understanding the computer science and so CPU code. Exploring internet functionality. Building a paper PC and designing new programs. January. So be it. Designing and creating cognitive artifacts. January, February. Of learning program made to assist little robots. Fabric, assembly ready, designing and building immersive environments. April, May. Reality task teams of free eye gems and code clues exchange with other teams to decode and find the gems. And finally, by your bring your own light.
Hello, participants of this virtual summit. My name is Shami Coelho Jairala, and it is my privilege to be here in this session talking about project management in project-based learning and STEAM-based learning and education. Over the next few minutes, I will be talking about the relationship between project management and these two topics, and why it is so important for teachers and students to learn and apply these techniques. So let's embark on this enlightening journey and uncover the strategies for effective project management and its intersection with education. Let's start with the difference between doing projects versus project-based learning. In the first one, the teacher has the knowledge, gives directions to the students, and the students follow the directions. In the second one, we ask questions. The student develop a solution and they apply the knowledge to solve a real world problem. So in the PBL, we promote critical thinking, creativity, and communication. The benefits are that the students are the owner of their learning. They collaborate in the decision-making process. And also maybe we include audience and other professionals so they can listen to the students. So we promote inclusion and prepare the students for the real world. This is, this have a relation with the STEAM-based learning when our goal is to foster these skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, and innovation. That means that PBL is using the STEM approach to engage the students in a practical and collaborative real world problems. But why is this important? And why do I have to talk to you about the importance of the project management? Because let's see, I want to plant a tree or a seed but I don't have a shovel. So when you ask for a student to do a project or to, or, or to work in a project-based learning on an esteem-based learning without giving them the skills of project management, you are, you are asking your kids to do something without the equipment, without the tools, without the methods to do the projects effectively. Remembering that the definition of the project is a temporary endeavor to create a result that means develops a product or a service, you should always, always have a plan. Because there is a difference between the project and the product that we are doing. The product, unlike the project, is not temporary. The product can last forever. So we need to have processes in the project management cycle combining the creative process between the five project management processes groups that are initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control and closing to develop this step-by-step -step way to do the projects when we are working with the students in a project-based environment. When we combine the project management processes with the creative processes, we will have four steps to apply in our educational process. They are identifying and understanding the challenge or the real world problem requirements. So the students have to know what is asking, what the teacher is asking me. The step two is defining the team project deliver deliverables, like many projects or tasks. The step three could be the team challenge project plan. And the step four is to review the project before you present the project. So in the first one, we as teachers, we have to give some ideas and tools for the students. For example, when they have to identify their requirements, maybe we can, we can give them an identification sheet, I like a tool to assist the team to complete this part of the project management process. And in step two, we can give them like a requirement of planning table. And the step three, we can teach them this skill because it is not only a discipline, the project management is also a skill. So they can create a project plan through the creation of a specific goals, exploring constraints, scope, team roles, resources, timelines, identifying risks, etc. So a well-developed project plan will keep students on course until its completion. And the final step four is like reviewing the solution. During the final review, they can also add something that they are missing 
before they are presenting the solution of the project. Because we have to remember that a goal without a plan is just a wish. Let's focus in this part, the planning. How do I start? How I, as a teacher, give the students the tools and techniques? First, you have to understand that the planning is a living being process. So you have, you have to connect it with execution and the controlling process. So you can give the, the student a kind of a template to make these resources constraints planning thing, the team project management, the deliverables and dependencies, and the roles and the responsibilities, and the milestones that they have to develop, and, and the resource planning worksheet, and also the risk management worksheet. We have to define the scope, and I want to share with you a technique, a very important technique that you have to develop with your students. It is called the work breakdown structure. It is a hierarchical decomposition of a total scope of work to be carried. The WBS represents the entire work specified in the current approved project scope. You can develop this with your students in a positive way. So you can develop um, this structure because it has no age limits. You can develop it with the little ones and also with the old ones and gives visibility to the planning. How does it work? In the first line, you put the project name. In the next line, you put the division of your project. In this example, I have that into phases, but you can also do it into small parts, like mini projects, like mini products of your project. For example, you have this, the house design, excavation, foundation, will. So you have all your house divided to develop this project. Another example that I like, that I love is the bicycle. You divide it into pieces, frame, crank, wheels, braking set, braking system. And you divide the frame into small pieces. So everyone in the room, everyone in the team understands the scope of the project. You can also do it like that in an outline way. You don't have to do it in, in, in the mind map way all the time. And you can also use a Kanban methodology that is a car that is used in the Japanese quality management industry right now. So it, since the beginning of the changes of the industry of Japan, so you can use this and also to apply like in an agile project management way, like when you have a backlog of the whole planning and then you plan into two weeks and you have this, the to do, the doing and done. You can do it with your students so they can learn and then they will do it by themselves. You can also apply it if you want into softwares because there are a lot of softwares available right now to use this kind of methodology. Let's see an example. I have this project for the students. They have to develop a story, a micro world scenery, a visual effect, and these two teen choice elements that are skills or talents that the students have. And we develop this. It is in Spanish right now, but we develop the, the, the story, <clears throat> the scenography, and all the things that they were asked. And we put it into a schedule. And we also put the responsibles here. So we have this real example that we use in uh, in a learning process that is called destination imagination. So we were able to apply all these project management techniques. Well, my conclusion is that you should give to the students these tools and techniques that are necessary for the students. You as a teacher should learn these techniques so you can teach them how to use them because you are the team manager. You become the coach of the project. So you should know how to plan and how to use these techniques, how to manage a scope, how to do a list of the requirements, how to make a team resource page and a risk a matrix. So you can apply them and have a better result for the projects. This is just a technique. It doesn't mean that you have to do it for 
every project that you have, but give them uh, the students the visibility, the discipline, and the skill of project management that is necessary today for the students and also for the enterprises. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Hello everyone, my name is Josina Flip. I just finished my master's degree in teaching physics and chemistry at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. And I'm going to present to you the work I did during this period with 10 great uh, students studying energy and its conservation. So you might be aware that STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Engineering Arts and Mathematics. And there can be several approaches to this uh, type of education, an additive way, an integrative way, an interdisciplinary way. In my work, I try to develop the integrative way, assembling all the five uh, different areas involved in STEAM education. Specifically, as opposed to STEM, the arts are included, so uh, I wanted to work in more um, detail the potential of arts in STEAM education, especially uh, regarding the complexity involved and the creativity that can be developed during problem solving. Uh, so, uh, the main research question was to address how uh, could STEAM education develop in students their cognitive structures, their creati creativity and also to integrate the areas involved and the competences involved in the associated areas but in this presentation i will focus in the question about the creativity development especially in problem solving and i did that by uh, doing a smith structures observation with the students and also uh, analyzing their written reports uh, and documents so the tasks developed with students uh, uh, had the main goal uh, for them to produce a soundtrack for a NASA animation video, How Do You Land on Mars? And the, the tasks were developed in a way they would um, integrate the, the areas involved and also to increase their level of complexity. And the, st uh, the students were studying energy in conservation, especially um, the th three physical phenomena like free fall. Uh, movement in inclined plane and uh, fall and bounce. Uh, here you can see uh, some parts of the making of uh, of the activities that develop. In terms of results, uh, students could explore sound exploration and they uh, could address different aspects of that, like the melody, the different melodies they could uh, use and produce, and also the, the, the rhythm patterns or the different uh, timber using different materials, they explore that, what developed their creativity, and also um, the degree of accuracy involved in synchronization of sound and image. This was very problematic for them as well in terms of problem solving, but they achieved that. Uh, and also other aspects in, uh, that were worked were, for example, the use of new technology using the Firefox app, and also the, the representation in graphics uh, made by the, the application or by them, and also the representation of the artifacts the students produced to uh, make um, the sound effects they, they wanted and that were appropriate to the, the video images. Also, uh, the, they also had this new experience recording with professional recording device that allowed them to uh, work uh, several new competences as well, involved in engineering, for example, the calibration, the, the adequacy of the room, etc. As a conclusion, 
I can uh, say that uh, using this uh, STEAM-based approach, students could fulfill the main goal that was to produce a soundtrack for a NASA animation video. And with that, they could develop a project with beginning, middle and end. And they did that in teamwork, what was very, very positive. Also, students develop their creativity to address problem solving, for example, in synchronization of the, the images with the sound, and also to, to build their artifacts in a way they could fulfill what they wanted in the, um, the sound effects they wanted to produce. So overall, I can conclude the STEAM education was a good approach to develop creativity in students regarding specifically problem solving. Thank you all. Hello. I'm very happy to be here with you today in uh, the second EASE Summit. I'm Iro Koliaku, uh, STEM Director of Anatolia College and member of the EASE Board, and I'm going to talk to you about the project called STEAMing the Future. So, uh, my school, uh, Anatolia College, is a non-profit institution located in Thessaloniki uh, with a history of over 125 years. Three years ago, we founded Anna Papayoriou STEM Center, a center dedicated to STEAM education and open to the whole educational community. So the project STEAMing the Future is a project that aims to promote inclusion and diversity in STEAM uh, through the development of, multi of a multidimensional educational platform. Uh, it combines online and face-to-face -face, uh, courses and the project is funded by Bodosakis uh, Foundation. Steaming the Future uh, offered last year uh, two face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, programs in the, uh, for the Xanthi region and online courses. And next year, with the support of Latsis Foundation, we're going to offer face-to-face uh, -face courses both for elementary and for high school students uh, in Thessaloniki in Anna Papa Georgiou STEM Center. So, uh, STEAMing the Future uh, last year uh, was a course uh, running in two cycles. Each cycle was comprised of two uh, weekends. Uh, and uh, there, last year, we had a total of uh, 38 students that participated in the face-to-face -face courses. And also, uh, we had over 300 students that participated in the online version uh, of the course. Uh, our team comprised of uh, educators uh, that really were excited about their field uh, and young engineers uh, that are just have just finished their engineering degrees and uh, had a lot to share uh, with the students. So we had seven topics. Uh, robotics and automation, introduction to 3D design, introduction to programming, app development, Big Data and Analytics, Internet of Things, and Citizen Science. And all these topics were fused together with uh, social and emotional learning. Uh, in order, so in order to bring uh, also these weekend programs into the classroom and promote the connection of STEAM and social and emotional learning in any classroom setting, uh, uh, with the support of Education Resilience in Europe and the Scientix uh, Partnership and Cisco, uh, we uh, transformed all the materials into materials that can be used in the classroom and that are translated also in the English language. Uh, I'm going to show you in a bit the web page where you can find all materials that are related to the courses. Um, so the aim uh, is to have students work on real world programs and help them uh, develop their cultural empathy, resilience and their creative thinking. 
So the Education Resiliency Europe Initiative is supported, as I said, by Scientix Partnership and is funded by Cisco. And along with uh, the project, uh, our, uh, Steaming the Future, there are a lot of other projects under this initiative that you can find and that are really interesting and useful for the classroom. So why is uh, the Steaming uh, the Future an important uh, project? Uh, because it supports teachers in order to culture competences that are not implemented in most schools in Europe, such as digital skills, critical thinking skills, empathy and creativity, and also make this connection with social and emotional learning and STEAM. So working on STEAM projects, as we all know, can be a real challenge. Students can develop uh, skills as creative uh, activity, critical thinking, communication skills, empathy, resilience. However, they have a lot of pressure sometimes, which may lead to anxiety, panic attacks, lack of con uh, concentration. So social and emotional support of children is vital in order to help them achieve maximum that they can. So there is a, a really big connection between the uh, key social and emotional abilities and STEAM abilities. And there are a lot of frameworks uh, that uh, you can look into. Uh, you can use the framework profiles created by Harvard Graduate School of Education in order to learn more about the specific frameworks and uh, see which fits more to your classroom uh, setting uh, and your teaching style. Uh, we uh, used for this project and we use in my school the Cassell model, uh, which has five key comp competences that social and emotional learning aims to address. Uh, and these are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. And for me, just, uh, just a tip um, before you decide uh, if uh, social and emotional learning is a way for you uh, a, a model for you to use you should ask yourself these questions uh, have self-awareness and ask yourself uh, do i believe that this kind of practices are important do i feel comfortable to show them in my class and will i do them uh, regularly and find uh, these practices that fit uh, your teaching style and your students learning uh, style um, so uh, we tested all the activities in the classroom. We had really wonderful results from our students. From uh, uh, We had a total of 78 uh, students. And uh, for me, uh, this, is, uh, this is a quote that one of our students wrote in the uh, evaluation of the course. He said that although at first I found the course a bit boring, I could not ignore the fact that I'm learning something new and I have nothing to lose from this. For this reason, I followed the course closely and at some point the things were working uh, on and we were working on started to interest me more and more. So I think this is uh, the essence to give students different kind of materials and get them uh, interested in, in topics, in new topics and get them to love learning and love science and technology so you can go to steamingthefuture.gr and here when it where it says steam embrace you can click and find all material uh, translated in english and adapted for the classroom so if you go down here we have each unit for example, introducing induction to programming. There are, is a, a PDF with a lesson outline, and there is also uh, a lesson materials, a PowerPoint and exercises and worksheets where you can find. And you can have this for all seven units for introduction to Arduino, the English version and the Greek version, um, the app development, the introduction to 3D printing, again, the lesson outline and all the lesson materials, Internet of Things, Big Data and Analytics, Citizen Science, and there is a special unit dedicated to social and emotional learning, 
where you can find uh, practices on social and emotional learning and more information on how to connect the framework with STEAM education. Uh, here at the end, you can find some more materials and tasks that you can give students that uh, want to want to go deeper and uh, be uh, and discover more about the topics. Thank you for listening to me, and don't hesitate to contact me at koliaku at anatolia.edu.gr for any questions. Good afternoon, my name is Chiara Stettini and I am a school science teacher and I've been working as a trainer for in-service and future science teacher for more than 20 years. Since 2022, I'm working with Polo Formativo Marotta. Polo Formativo Marotta is a STEAM training center for teachers of all school levels on STEAM activities that's financed by the Italian Ministry of Education. Uh, during the courses I led about didactics of STEAM with virtual and augmented reality, different groups of teachers carried out research action activities, uh, stimulating them to use QR codes in a creative way. Nowadays, QR codes are currently used in our everyday life. They can store a large amount of data and quickly connect users to online content, application, or services. Even in the classroom, QR codes enable teachers to create a digital learning atmosphere that would accommodate the learning styles of each student. So QR codes can be used to provide access to course content, connect with students, encouraging collaboration, assess student learning, provide examples and additional support and feedback, and making learning interactive. In this way, can extend learning opportunities. In the next slides, I will show you some of the activities realized by teachers using QR codes in a creative way. The first activity is the snail and the whale and is for kids aged three, four years old. It started with the storytelling of the story and the representation with the paintings and so on of the sea and its inhabitants in a traditional way. But then teachers drew a five or five grid on the floor representing the ocean. On the grid, QR codes 
have been placed linked to pictures of sharks, noisy speedboats, and other dangers of the sea. So pupils should find the way, the correct way, scanning QR codes with their smartphones or tablets. In this other activity, celebrating Earth Day, uh, pupils studied about uh, their planets and uh, drawing and uh, writing text about what they learned, and then challenging each other with quizzes scanned with QR codes on the app Learning App. Finally, pupils built a paper cube, decorating it with the colors of our planet, on whose faces they passed the QR codes of the activities carried out in the classes. Each cube collects all the digital materials produced on Earth Day, which can always be used by both pupils and teachers. In this other activity, the food pyramid was the final product for pupils aged 11, 12 years old on the principle of an earthy diet. After producing materials like videos, pictures, quizzes, and even histograms related to Mediterranean diet, pupils stick them on a paper pyramid and uh, this is a, a nice way to store all the material produced and to remember the, the shape of the correct diet, the pyramid. In this other activity, I love my city, uh, pupils were engaged in disseminating the beauties, artistic and natural beauties of their territory. After transforming all the material uh, in QR codes, uh, some of them draw the, uh, a map of their city with QR codes uh, strategically placed on the interesting spot, uh, while others uh, realize a paper cube with them. In this other activity, a periodic table with QR and AR, the periodic table was realized by pupils of 11, 12 years old in two different ways. They use a QR code to report the history of the table and the characteristics of the main elements. Then they realized a paper table with the, uh, these symbols of the elements um, that were uh, collected by this app, Rap Chemistry. Rap Chemistry is an app that uses augmented reality uh, for viewing uh, Niels Bohr's atomic model in 3D. In the last activity, pupils aged 14 years old uh, realized a virtual herbarium on the Mediterranean flora of the territory, um, putting QR codes linked to video, pictures, and text um, on the Mediterranean flora. So, thank you for your attention and enjoy teaching with QR codes. Hello, I am Sujit Patricharya, and today's topic for me is Unlock the Power of IoT with Microbit. Um, many thanks to Eve for allowing me to uh, present this uh, important concept of uh, the IoT and how we can uh, use my Microbit uh, to, uh, um, to unlock the potential of IoT. Uh, so I'll start off with uh, a very brief introduction about myself. So I'm Sujit Patricharya, and uh, I have uh, uh, been the mentor for the local um, electronics and robotics club, and also we have some kind of global initiative. Um, and not to take 
talk uh, much time about myself, but to give you uh, something about my professional experience, I have been working, uh, I had worked with the Indian Space Research World Organization is so for around 16 years in terms of satellite payload development. I also worked with ESA European Space Agency for the Solar Orbiter Satellite. I'm very proud that my design is up in the uh, up in the sky, uh, going uh, very close to the sun. And uh, worked with a very um, uh, sensitive radar, uh, and also at present working with British Aerospace for space and defense. So uh, this is my professional experience. Uh, more than 32 years of uh, professional experience in electronics and communication um, field. Uh, my education background is that I have PhD from University of Edinburgh, from my master's in signal processing from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and my bachelor's uh, in electronics and communication also from India. I worked as a research fellow at the University, Queen's University, Belfast, and also at Imperial College London. Uh, so I've been associated uh, uh, with uh, various academic institutes, and I have uh, academic affiliations uh, uh, in UK as a mentor for the Art Engineering Scholarship and Enterprise Advisor for the Form Different uh, Future, uh, mentor for the NUFL Research and STEM Ambassador, very active STEM Ambassador. I'm also governor of a local village college, and I have been judges, judge for a lot of various national and international competitions. Um, so yeah, this is uh, where I, I have other associations as well in terms of my uh, professional and educational affiliations. Um, and also recently I've been a uh, my, my Microbit Global Champion 2022 and 2023. I'm here with uh, uh, so many other ambassadors and um, being a Microbit Champion uh, gives us uh, additional responsibility of uh, uh, reaching out uh, to students, teachers and educators uh, in, in respect to the physical computing and in terms of promoting STEM. Okay, so just that was a brief introduction about myself and uh, today I have uh, uh, only just 20-25 minutes uh, for me to present uh, uh, what is an IoT, what is the basic concept and how can we get started with IoT and the microbit. So we'll take a very small example of a smart garden where we are trying to monitor some of the parameters which is present in the garden. Uh, to quickly get started, what is internet? We all have been using internet and we know that internet is a global network of interconnected computers. It is when the computers all over the world get gets connected to each other through uh, some gateway and other kind of things, uh, we have this uh, uh, internet in place. And we have uh, seen that the internet, if you want to access any information uh, from your computer, say for example, you have to send a request. Uh, when you enter into uh, a web browser and you give a request, uh, uh, the request from your computer goes in and to the uh, through the uh, gateway uh, and the information is routed back to your uh, computer. Uh, so it is a network of connected devices in terms of uh, the computers that we have what is called as the internet. And uh, and uh, if I go a bit deep into it, so each of this computer, which is capable of uh, uh, sending the request and communicating in um, uh, internet would also have some kind of address, which is called as an IP address. I give an equivalence of a postal address. The letter gets sent uh, by a user and it comes to us because we have a postal address in it and we can also get the address we can also have the address of the sender. So similarly, when you request any information in the internet, you have the sender address and you have the destination address. So that's how the communication takes place within the computer. Now, uh, people have been communicating uh, very effectively with this internet from the one computer to the another computer. Uh, but what is this internet of things? We, if, we, if we now move, from computer to things like you know anything everyday objects like you know it could be uh, your washing machine it could be your um, it could be your refrigerator uh, any device which is capable uh, to communicate in the internet uh, is uh, internet of things like you know we call up internet of things it is about connectivity connecting everyday objects right but as we have seen before like, you know, uh, each of these devices, if they want to communicate, they have to have some kind of address associated with it, or what we call as an IP address associated with it. So now we have billions of physical devices that have been collected through all, 
the world, around the world. Uh, some examples, I've just put some images, uh, which was uh, quite readily available in the internet. You can do a Google search and find these examples of IoT. Uh, you can refrigerate, can communicate to us that when the milk is, uh, and we have a lot of students who have uh, uh, gone through my course of this IoT and have presented a demonstration. Uh, if I get an opportunity to, to show you one of the demonstration uh, and you can see how 11 years old or 10 years old students can easily uh, work with the microbit and do all this uh, beautiful uh, projects, including the examples what has been shown here. So as we rightly know that when we have all these things which are connected to the internet and then we have some kind of potential um, uh, this device to become a smart in terms of, you know, and make our life very simple. Like, you know, if you're rushing to the office and you have, uh, you have uh, the milk which is uh, low, uh, in quantity, it can uh, give you a prompt uh, on your device, mobile device, or it can send you an email uh, telling you that, oh, you have to buy a milk and everything becomes automated and you spend less time worrying about your other things and uh, concentrate more on your work or other things that you are more interested in. So there are several examples and we are seeing slowly these all things are getting integrated in our life and in, in our day-to-day -day use. So in IoT, when we have called this as a smart things, a smart thing is anything with an IP address and it's capable to communicate uh, in the internet, uh, it can be categorized as um, uh, three broad classification. One is that some of the things can only collect information, physical, environmental uh, information, and pass it on to the cloud. We say the cloud is another server which is sitting somewhere else, or you can receive some information uh, from the cloud and act on it, or you can think uh, you can do both of it. Like, you know, you can have either the sender or the receiver or transmitter receiver, or you can have both. So, so we have the combination of three possible uh, things which we can connect to the internet. Now, we understand this, that connecting the physical world to the internet via sensors and actuators. So I bring in two important terminologies in terms of technical kind of thing. One is a sensor. <clears throat> a sensor is any device which can gather information from the physical world, right? Say, for example, uh, temp measuring the temperature, uh, light intensity, speed. But remember, any physical thing that, is been, uh, that has been um, gathered or measured has to be converted into electrical form for it to be passed on to any process. Right, so we have to have some kind of uh, physical to electrical conversion, and that is what the sensor does. So the sensor converts the physical measurement into electrical kind of thing for it to be interfaced to the computer. Then we have the other way around, where you have the electrical signal getting converted to the real world, such as like you know, it could be turning on the lights, making sound and those kind of things. So actuators, so example of sensor could be a light sensor. It could be a microphone because it picks up the sound. It could be a camera because it can see through it, <coughs> see uh, the physical world. It can sense the light. Uh, the microphone senses the sound. The actuators could be like a, a speaker, like, you know, which is creating sound. Uh, it could be a motor, which is moving, and it could be an LED, which is uh, turning on and off and those kind of things. It could be a relay, which is switching on and off. So we have two main things. One is a sensor and actuators for it uh, it to be uh, more useful in terms of like, you know, some kind of application like where you have the smart garden or you want to measure anything physical and you want to take action. And these are referred to as connected device because all these things can get connected to each other. So for example, a light sensor can get connected to the cloud and the cloud can then uh, uh, switch on the motor for pumping the water out kind of, those kind of things can ha all happen and they are all called as a connected device. But remember, the, all this connected device must have some IP address associated with it. That's that's very important. Um, and then uh, what is happening, what, what, how, why this IoT has become uh, so popular now because we have a very low cost devices, computer chip like microbit is one such, sensors are becoming uh, very cheap. Uh, there is advancement in the code. So the coding is not very complex. Now you can do a block coding, visual coding is there. You can do text coding in Python and other kind of thing. Uh, hardware has become very uh, accessible. Uh, there's a huge data storage. Someone else can store the data for us. And, and availability of high bandwidth network. So basically you are pumping in so much of data, so it should be able to also handle those kind of bandwidth of the data. So the main IoT features is the connect, connect various things to IoT, analyze the data. So these are some of the things which can take place later on, but now, because once you have the data, once you send it to the cloud, 
you can access it in any, any any computer. You can do the analysis of the data. Say, for example, it could be as simple as calculate the minimum uh, temperature, calculate the maximum temperature, calculate the average temperature, calculate the range of temperature, and those kind of things. So we can have some kind of analysis done. And we can also integrate a lot of other things. Let's say, for example, if you are trying to measure the temperature and if you are saying or if you are measuring the soil moisture and if you think the soil moisture is very low, but at the same time, if you can read the weather forecast and if you see that it's not going to rain, it is only then you actuate, uh, then it is only then that you activate the pump to uh, pump the water out. Otherwise, if you feel that, uh, if you if you know that it is going to rain, then there is no point in, uh, you know, uh, putting the pump on. So those kind of things can be done uh, with the IoT applications kind of thing. So the components of IoT, to put it in the figure, is that you have a sensor, you have a gateway, your gateway is where you are collecting all the sensor information and passing on to the cloud. And then uh, you have the cloud and the server, the cloud or the server, and then you have the application. So these are the major components. And we will see how we, we can go ahead with the micro bit and address all these things um, uh, through the micro bit uh, uh, and have an application of uh, IoT. So the micro bit is very powerful in terms of that it has a processor in it. So it has a brain and you can program it through make code, very simple programming language like a scratch based visual programming. I'll show you some of the program which I have as a display kind of thing. Then it also has sensors, very, very important. The sensors are collecting some of the physical uh, parameters or physical environmental parameters like light. It have, what are the sensors that are present in the micro bit? You have a temperature sensor, you have a light sensor, you have a physical buttons, which you can use it to uh, sense uh, the, uh, press it to activate some something or other. You, it has a motion sensor, it has a touch uh, kind of thing. It has a magnetic sensor. It has, also, it can also hear sound kind of thing. So it has a, it has a microphone as well in terms of sensor. And what is the actuators, so like what it can do externally for you to, it, it has a speaker and it also has a display. So that is microbit version two. So microbit version two has a speaker, it has a microphone. And what are the other features which are very important for the communication is the radio communication. That means one microbit can talk to another microbit or several microbits. Then you can have the microbit talking to another mobile phone, say for example, to the Bluetooth. Or if you have a physical connector uh, at the bottom, as you can see, where you can connect external sensors. So in a way, uh, the microbit is very powerful for the IoT application uh, that it has a brain where you, which you can program. Uh, it has a sensors, it has several sensors, it has several actuators. But what it lacks uh, for it to be uh, directly plugged into uh, IoT or to the cloud is the Wi-Fi connectivity. It doesn't have the uh, the 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 IP uh, the IP addressing capability so that it doesn't connect itself to the cloud. So what is the way around? So what we can do is that we can use our own PC, say for example, a laptop or a mobile phone or some IoT kit or EPS32, those kind of processors, small processor, very, very uh, cost-effective processors, uh, which are uh, which which has the capability of transmitting or sending data uh, or getting connected to the internet. So in, in, in our example, we'll just talk about uh, two microbits talking to each other through the radio link. One can be in the garden and then can be connected to the PC and we'll use the PC to go and send our data to the cloud. So that would be one of the very simplest uh, way of uh, uh, checking if our micro bit can be set up for the uh, for the IoT application. So what uh, the general framework that I'm going to address is that we have sensors. Say, for example, this sensor is a garden sensor, where I keep this in the garden and I measure some of the parameters through the sensors. I do a radio transmission. Um, it, it, this sensor is in the garden and this uh, this uh, this micro bit uh, can receive this radio signal, which can be on my study table in the first floor. And then it is connected to the PC. From the PC, I write a very small application and then send the data to the cloud. And the cloud could have the dashboard and other kind of things so that we can uh, see the dial changing and the graph been plotted, which is a real-time kind of thing. Okay, so that is a general setup, and we will have a radio link, we'll have a serial link, we call the serial communication, we can have a Wi-Fi connectivity to the account, and then we have the dashboard, so sorry. And this is 
uh, where we go for with the following steps. I'll not be able to uh, go in too much of details because of short of time, but what is that you are interested? Uh, sensor, read the sensor value, do a radio transmission. Gateway, receive the radio, uh, radio receive the data in another micro bit here in this micro bit and, uh, and, and serially transmit it to the computer. So there is another communication, which is the serial communication. This is a radio communication. This is a serial communication. And once you have this serial data coming into your PC, then you can send it to the cloud, right? Through the Wi-Fi and we can write a small Python program, which will take the serial data and transfer it to the cloud, right? And in the cloud, you can have the dashboard. So the dashboard could consist of the graphs, the dials and other kind of things. So those are the basic steps. So let me uh, quickly highlight the sensor options that we have. So we have in sensors option, we have categorized into internal to micro bit and one is the external, which can connect uh, externally. You can connect a lot of sensors through this golden connector. We will concentrate on so many others. As, as because we have so many sensors, we'll just concentrate on the light sensor and see what the micro bit can do with the light sensor. So reading the light sensor is pretty simple uh, and we will see how it uh, how we can do. So internal light sensor is the LED on the screen. The screen itself is a light sensor uh, for the micro bit, um, which, 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 which not only uh, transmits the, uh, the light, but it can also receive light intensity. So what we can do is that write a very simple program on the block coding, which is a make code.microbit.org uh, has this feature where what, what instruction I'm getting? So when I press button A, I should show a string A just in order to check that I press button A. Then I can send uh, radio, send number zero, uh, and pause for this and show string. So this is uh, just radio send number zero. This is this is just to test the radio interface, and it is sending number zero. Instead of sending number zero, you can send the light value. So it sends uh, not only that it senses the light value, it also transmits the radio signal. So we'll see that uh, later on and uh, have a complete program, which is with the internal light sensor. So what we are trying to do right now is go with the sensor, which is internal and the light. The interface could be radio and the programming could be blocked. The other, other options are something which we have not uh, uh, highlighted because we are not going to use it right now, but there is a possibility of using it in the future. So light sensor, yeah, I'm, I'm going to the very basic thing of the light sensor. So as I said before, the light sensor is this LED. And if you reverse bias it, don't worry about the reverse bias and all the thing, it can measure the intensity of the light. So zero is the lowest intensity and 255 is the highest intensity is a scale. Uh, zero means dark and 255 means light, uh, uh, good amount of light. And you can read, initialize and read the sensor. Value. That's the first step that we do. Can you read the uh, sensor value. So I've created a variable called bright and I've assigned bright to light and then I'm showing it on my string. So this is a very, very simple um, uh, example uh, where you can see the data and you can change the light value in the simulator to see the change. And you can download the program and you can immediately see that your micro bit is sensing all the light. Once the garden sensor senses the light through this program, it has to transmit serially to the PC. And what is the serial communication? Is the USB cable which is connected uh, to your computer. Uh, the one way, uh, one way use of this connector is to send the program and download it into the micro bit. The other way is to, uh, for the micro bit to send data serially to the PC. So we use that same USB cable to send data from the micro bit to the PC. So what happens actually is the transmitter is connected to the receiver and the receiver of the micro bit is connected to the transmitter of the uh, PC. So this is what is called serial communication. The data is serially transmitted through one cable and is not multi uh, parallel, uh, parallel communication means you have to have multiple lines for the data to ship, which is much faster than the serial. But serial is very simple because you have to minimum connectivity between two devices. So that is what in brief what is serial communication. How do, how can you have the serial communication in the micro bit in terms of program is just one simple instruction which is called plot bar graph. This plot bar graph will not only plot the uh, light level on the screen, but it will also send serial data to the with the computer, which you can see either in the make code by simulating the device, by, by, by capturing the device information, or you can uh, see it in any other uh, serial communication. Like it can directly go to the Excel. Excel has uh, a new feature of getting data serial uh, serial data directly. And you can also use something called web serial or new code and other kind of thing. 
So the second way of, uh, uh, if you don't want to use a plot one, the second one, which is much more preferred, is uh, to have a serial communication. There is instruction, which is there in the control block, probably, where you can do a serial communication. You have transfer. You, in fact, the transmit of the uh, microbit should be connected to the receive, as I shown before. But uh, in order to make uh, the command very simple, they have connected transmit to USB. They expect you to connect transmit to USB in terms of program drop, drop down RX to R. Um, uh, um, RX to USB RX, and then at a baud rate, this is the speed of communication, which is 115200, which is highest. You can drop down and see there's the highest communication speed that you can have. Then we, what we do, every 500 milliseconds, every regular interval of 500 milliseconds, I send this data serially out to the to the to the PC. So this is how the microbit, the second microbit, can serially communicate to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the PC. But remember, in this example, we are using the light sensor of the second microbit, not the first microbit. Because if you have to use the first microbit, you have to send it radio, and then you have to send it. But here we are just giving an example how you can send the light information from the second microbit to the uh, to the PC through the serial communication. <laughs> so now, if I bring into radio uh, radio one so i can go for a radio link so the sensor in the garden will send the information here and this in turn will send the data out uh, to the pc serially so this micro bit the second micro bit is a receiving the radio so it is a radio receiver and serial transmitter so i think that should be clear because it receives a radio signal from the first uh, micro bit, which is there in the garden. So it is a radio receiver, and that information is transmitted serially uh, to the uh, PC. Uh, that is what is uh, the serial communication. So we have a radio, and in the micro bit version one, the antenna is here. In micro bit uh, version two, the antenna is bits uh, slanted. <clears throat> so you have the antennas for the micro bit to communicate uh, from one micro bit to the other micro bit. So we can have a very simple side uh, project. You can build yourself. Uh, you have to set the channel because every radio communication requires a channel, like a TV channel and the radio channel, you have to set up a channel. The transmitter and receiver should be set to the same channel, otherwise it won't be able to communicate. And say, for example, here, if I send radio send one, this it will re receive this number and show you the number one. So it is a very simple uh, experiment that you can do and check if that is working or not. So we have put it as a micro TX and one micro RX. The TX is transmitter of the light information to the micro RX, which is is radio and then it goes serially. So this is a block diagram that uh, we are trying to implement and then we can push the data from the PC to the cloud, which could be, uh, there are several options now. You can have an IoT plotter, very simple to use. Adafruit is also very simple. Do it IoT, uh, ThinkSpeak and B, uh, Blink kind of thing. All there are, uh, all of this has a free version, and with, but with some limitation. If I go for the IoT plotter, because I don't have enough time for you to, uh, me to explain, but feel free to contact me anytime and get more information say so for example i create i go to the iot plotter i create the i create the feed and uh, I, I can make this public so public so that if if i want uh, me, uh, um, me to show you the data coming in out from my microbit i can do that you can check that link and you can so what is the important things that you have to do in iot plotter capture the key value which you can set you can get uh, you you always always uh, you are always assigned a key value with your username and then you have uh, created a light graph which is the name of the graph and you have the feed id so with this information you can we can write a very simple uh, python program i have created by iot plotter pc uh, which uh, and also can uh, have a configuration file where i have put all this information for me to run and push the data so what i have done on my machine is that i can now uh, send manually say for example to check if 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 my things are working i can manually check uh, send data to my light graph feed in the cloud. But remember this IoT plotter, uh, the free version uh, allows you to update the data only after 15 seconds. So that's a limitation because it's a free version that I'm trying to use. And you can see immediately that whatever value that I enter comes up in the, in the, in the light feed uh, in the IoT plotter. So you can also use the similar concept for Adafruit IO. You can create your account, create a new dashboard. Say, for example, I have created a smart dashboard and uh, and give some description to it. You can create the feed. I have given uh, two feeds. One is a light feed and a temperature feed. So I want to feed two data coming in microbit, not, not one uh, uh, parameter, but two parameters. 
and then you can also create a dial associated with all these feeds like you know it can show you very nice dials like i have created these dials and i can give the minimum uh, minimum value to the maximum value and so the temperature is zero to uh, so the light is zero to 255 temperature is actually from minus five to uh, 50 degree but i have put it zero to 50 degree that's okay and then you can run another utility program which is also very simple utility program which grabs the data uh, from the uh, from the first micro bit as you know the first micro bit is sending the data uh, through the radio link to the second micro bit so there are two um, uh, and the second micro bit has to also receive the data and send it to the uh, send it serially out to the uh, to the to the computer to the, to my laptop and the laptop is running this program to capture the serial data and send it to the cloud uh, to the other food kind of thing so say for example if i run this program what would happen is that you know like uh, i can have this uh, dummy uh, program where i can manually enter my uh, light value and temperature value so i'm going in steps i'm not connecting the micro bit directly to the cloud i'm creating a dummy uh, uh, values 10, 20, and trying to check if that goes to the cloud. If that goes to the cloud, then my second part would be the final integration. And what is the final integration? Is this code, <clears throat> which is uh, which is capturing the data. So for example, what I've done, I have created a serial communication here, and I'm saying, can you send this light level and the temperature from this is, and you have only one micro bit, which is connected to the PC, right? So you don't have the second, uh, first micro bit, which is there in the garden. So say, for example, you don't have a garden micro bit. You have only one micro bit, which is connected to the PC, and you are interested in sending the light information and the temperature information from this micro bit number two to the cloud directly. And next step, we, we can uh, have another micro bit, which talks to this micro bit, um, a different program uh, through the radio link and send it. <clears throat> so this is, we are going in steps. Uh, only one micro bit because some of the students can have only one micro bit. So we have created light and sorry, uh, we have created the light and the temperature, and then we send it as an array uh, to the to the to the to the uh, to the uh, PC to capture it. But in case you have two micro bits, you can have the radio transmit one, which will just transmit the light value and the temperature value. Right, light and the temperature value every say for example every 15 seconds that's what i have done because i want to use this for iot plotter as well so this is very good because it it what is this doing this is just sending so this in this serial transmission is actually not required in this radio transmit i should remove the serial because this radio transmit which is there in the garden is not involved in any serial communication so this is not required uh, what is required is the radio communication once the radio communication is done from the transmit the receiver will definitely have this serial uh, um, communication protocol because that is where the serial communication between the micro bit number two to the pc is taking place so it is receiving the value uh, light and the temperature and then what is happening is that it is writing serial the array this two uh, two values are written as an array to the to the to the uh, to the pc so there, there are some flags which have been set just in order to uh, in order to check if uh, the flags are properly set because if you receive L flag is to zero and T flag L flag is the light flag and T flag is the uh, is the is the temperature flag so you can then tell which flag uh, to and then again we have a similar program uh, more or less similar program where it receives uh, where we run the program with the actual micro bit two micro bits and we send the data to the cloud. Again, the same way we have the configuration data. And you can see that uh, I have put uh, here that if you have one micro bit, use this program. If you have two micro bit, use this program. And then um, uh, the my, when you have the micro bit connected, it will uh, capture the data and it will display here and I send it to the cloud. So if I if I if I show you the whole setup, it is something like this. This is a transmitter which is uh, inside my house, but it is like as because it's raining outside. So I put it as a garden, and this is my receiver which is there in the study table and uh, study study room study room, and then it is displaying the value and it is also showing you the dial graph kind of thing. So you can see that uh, and this dashboard. If you have created an account, you can uh, see my dashboard and. And you can see all these dials and the graph which has been changing in real time. So I have one of my students uh, who is demonstrating it. So you can have a look at it, how simple this is if you have the right programs with you. Right. Just look Hello, everyone. My name is Adit and this is my microbit project. 
Many times in our day-to-day -day life, we forget to water the plants in our garden. My program helps you remember when to. It sends you a reminder every day at 12 o'clock to water the plants. And if it's too hot, like in the summer season, when it gets really hot, it sends you reminders more frequently to water the plants. These time, the timing at 12 o'clock can be changed uh, as per the user's convenience. So this is the dashboard where it records the temperature of the transmitter micro bit. This transmitter micro bit will be in the garden in the proper setup. Uh, and when the temperature reaches 30, it will send you a mail saying you need to water the plants because it is too hot. Uh, and this is easy for the users to read because uh, it can be sent directly to their phone and their, or their watch. Uh, and every day at 12 o'clock, which t the timing can be changed, it will send you this mail. It is time to water the plants. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Bye. Thank you. That was Adit, one of my students, very young, and he has done the whole setup uh, in a very, very elegant way and demonstrated that it is indeed possible to get an activation from the cloud to your email that if the temperature is exceeded a certain value, you can then uh, tell that uh, tell uh, get an email notification as well. So we have the radio link, we have the serial link, we have the Wi-Fi, and then we have the dashboard. So that was a very quick demonstration of the power uh, of IoT, which we can unlock with the help of a microwave. I have my uh, 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 QR code. You can connect me in WhatsApp. There is a lot of other information available, and I'll be happy to support you and uh, look forward for your interaction. And, 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 and let's see how we all can use the microbit uh, to push data to the cloud. Thank you so much, and bye for now. As we close the enlightening first day of our gathering, we look back on a re rewarding exchange of innovative ideas and formative discussions concerning the future of STEAM education. We united under a collective goal to elevate STEAM education across Europe. Your participation today as speakers or attendants underscores your embrace of this vital mission. Day one has undoubtedly set the tone for our journey, beginning a process aimed at enhancing STEAM education that will continue tomorrow. The questions posed and the knowledge shared honor the spirit of inquiry inherent in STEAM itself. The diverse perspectives represented today illustrate the immense potential we have when we collaborate across borders. We appreciate the insights you've all, speakers, shared today, fortifying our collective understanding and causing ripples of impact that will touch countless classrooms and learning environments throughout Europe. Looking forward to day two, we anticipate more interesting presentations. Your continued active participation is essential as we navigate through our agenda designed to stimulate dialogue, foster connections and galvanize action for the improvement of STEAM education. A great thank you for all the speakers who gave us the possibility to listen to their thoughts, experiences and visions generously prepared and that surely are helping to shape STEAM education in Europe. Our rendezvous continues on next Saturday at precisely 2 uh, o'clock at the afternoon European Central Time. Let's meet again online ready to plunge into another day of deep learning and rich collaboration. Your presence is not only welcomed, but is crucial to this collective exploration and shaping the future of STEAM education across Europe. On behalf of the EASE Summit Organizing Committee, we thank you 
for your invaluable participation in Patronage today. We eagerly anticipate connecting with you tomorrow. Let us continue this crucial conversation that has the potential uh, to unite us under the scope of STEAM education. See you tomorrow.